welcome viewers to this set of two lectures on modern European history and alongside me is Manisha Sharma. She is sign language interpreter and uh, the topic that we would be talking about today is Europe in the interwar period. When I say interwar period, basically the implication is the period between the two world wars. So, the chronological coverage of this lecture should be around those critical 30 years that separated the first world war with the second world war. So, you can say it should be ranging from say 1914 to around 1945 or for that matter 1918 to 1939, the time when first world war ended and the time when the second world war began. Now, having spoken about this chronological bracket, uh, let us also understand that now when we talk of modern Europe say in 1910s and 1920s, we have another power to reckon with and this is the United States of America across the Atlantic and the European dominance in terms of colonial possessions and so forth is getting challenged. In fact, uh, there is greater degree of uh, uh, I would say reputation that America has built around this time and that is very clear in the politics and uh, economics of the period that is the interwar period. We also have very powerful uh, world statesmen who are talking about a different kind of world order altogether. We have the American president and we also have the USSR now. So, Russia has transformed itself into the, uh, into the Union of Soviet Socialist Republic and it stands for a different kind of politics and economic planning and different kind of a world order altogether away from capitalism. So, on the one hand, we have the American system premised on capitalism, liberal democratic system premised on capitalism. On the other hand, we have a different socialist system uh, which is not premised on capitalism and which is calling for a different kind of world order and trying to elicit support from several colonies who were promised uh, freedom after the first world war at the behest of the warring factions of uh, either of the sides uh, in Europe and the failed promise uh, in the post war situation. So, first world war ended, but these countries, these, colon uh, these colonies could not quite attain independence. And so, there is some kind of frustration with the western powers who were engaged in the first world war and these colonies, India included, uh, are gravitating towards the USSR and the interwar period that is 1920s, 1930s uh, tell this story uh, very eloquently. So, to begin with, one can say uh, and I am quoting Charles Smear here, the American historian and he has emphasized how Woodrow Wilson and on the other Woodrow Wilson, the American president and Lenin, the USSR leader at this, at this time that is uh, at, at, the, at the close of the first world war are offering different and yet new ways of perceiving the modern state system. And uh, they are uh, they are visualizing the world order uh, in ways that uh, that has pertinence outside their countries as well. So Wilson and Lenin both were making global statements in the 20th century in the interwar period. So what is it that Lenin is saying? Lenin's uh, call is almost a radical cry to overturn the old state system through world revolution 
and that is what he referred to as the socialist revolution. And please remember, it is premised not on nationalities and nation states because uh, the socialist uh, 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 socialist ideology regards or for that matter communist ideology regards nation and nation states as the handiwork of the bourgeoisie. So, uh, they, they, they think that nation states have come into being to safeguard the interests of the bourgeoisie and the industrial working class's interest cannot best be served under uh, such liberal uh, nationalist regimes. So, Lenin is uh, talking about uh, a different kind of world revolution. He also called for self-determination of non-European peoples which enlarged its international program and questioned the foundations of the Westphalia system which had privileged the power of Europe over others. So, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a call for a different kind of world order and uh, there is fair degree of internationalism in the visualization by Lenin and uh, he thinks that uh, through making this uh, through making this appeal through making this uh, radical cry he is questioning the very foundations of westphalia system and if this system goes then alongside it will go the privileged position of europe over the uh, over, over particularly the uh, the colonized countries europe between the first two world wars had a total of 28 states and this tells you the story. In 1920s except two all were democracies, parliamentary system with elected governments, range of political parties, guarantee of individual rights as the, uh, as the general attributes of such democracies. So, Right at the uh, finish of the First World War in 1920, except two of the total 28 states that Europe had, all were democracies, all were liberal democratic regimes guaranteeing the, uh, the rights uh, and privileges that we just uh, spoke about, you can see it on your slides. It could be parliamentary system with elected governments, range of political parties, guarantee of individual rights and so forth. Whereas, by the time we reach 1939, the, sta the, the starting point of the Second World War, so if you take the figures from 1938, then 16 of these 28 had succumbed to dictatorship. Leaders possessing absolute power beyond the constraint of the constitution or elections and that is how very loosely one can understand uh, dictatorship. So, uh, the constitutionality or the power and authority emerging from the mandated constitutions that is thrown out of the window in dictatorial regimes and in 1939, right at the cusp of the Second World War, 16 of them had succumbed to dictatorship. USSR and Hungary as leftist, uh, you can say uh, pursuing leftist politics, while 14 were pursuing the rightist uh, uh, dictatorships. So, uh, and, and please understand, when we say dictatorial regimes, it cuts across uh, either of the two ideologies, be it, uh, be it uh, uh, right wing or be it the left wing. So, even USSR is a dictatorial, uh, was a dictatorial uh, politics uh, uh, like Hungary and there are several others that uh, we all know about the Nazi uh, Germany, fascist uh, uh, Italy and so forth. Uh, they can be clubbed as, as pursuing right wing politics, uh, dictatorial nevertheless. Now, in 1938, 12 democracies were there, 
Seven of these were torn apart between 1939 and 1940. So, right at the beginning of the Second World War, whatever uh, reduced number of democracies that we had in 1938, of them, seven were torn apart. And uh, that also tells you as to how uh, radicalized uh, either ways uh, through left wing uh, uh, politics or through right wing politics the situation was of Europe uh, at the cusp of the uh, Second World War. So much so that uh, the 12 democracies that had somehow managed to survive uh, the interwar period, uh, the, uh, the, the decades between the First and the Second World War, seven of them were torn apart. In 1940, only five democracies remained intact. So, the stress and the strain of those tumultuous decades of 1920s and 1930s were very much evident and liberal politics perhaps just did not quite have an answer to it, to the rising aspirations of people, the failed promises, the, uh, the lack of trust in uh, political systems and so forth, the, uh, the uh, uh, upsurge of uh, charismatic uh, leaders uh, and so forth, which are, which are so proverbial of these turbulent decades, uh, 1920s and 1930s in Europe. So, in 1940, only five democracies remained intact and in this you can include the UK, Ireland, Sweden, Finland and Switzerland. Now, what are the kinds of dictatorships that we are talking about? Dictatorships of the proletariat. Now, when we say dictatorships of the proletariat, the obvious connotation here is that of uh, leftist countries uh, like uh, uh, USSR and so forth. So, uh, this, uh, this uh, can be understood as some kind of a temporary phase in which the principles of communism would be applied. So, uh, why this dictatorship? Dictatorship of proletariat is justified in leftist writings as a temporary phase which is very much required uh, so that communism or communist principles could be applied through the agency of the state and then eventually in the scheme of things, in the scheme of leftist politics, uh, it is presumed that even uh, socialist state will not be required, the states will wither away and what it will give rise to is smaller communes and that will be the order of the day. So, that is what communism actually meant. And when communism arrives, then uh, there would be no necessity of the state because private property would have been done away with and so forth. So, it would be stateless society and it, it would also be classless society. So, it would be free from class strife or class tension, which is the dynamo of uh, historical progression in leftist writings, in leftist scheme of things. And if there is no class strife, what will fuel history? What will fuel class struggle? And therefore, it is presumed that there will not be any class struggle and state would not be required. So, some uh, commentators uh, jokingly and sarcastically uh, write about this, uh, this future situation, imagined situation as end of history as well. Right? So, there is no fuel for history to progress and therefore, that would mark the end of history uh, as well. And uh, in Russia, so, what, what we just discussed is the, uh, is the predictive aspect of uh, Marxism, uh, what, it, uh, what it presumed would happen. Obviously, it did not happen that way and uh, uh, the interwar politics uh, stands as testimony to this. In Russia, Lenin therefore established the Bolshevik regime in October 1917 after the overthrow by force of course of the semi-liberal provisional government which had disposed of the Tsarist empire in March and Lenin's temporary dictatorship was 
given a permanent base by Stalin who succeeded him and who came to power in 1924. Hungary on the other hand underwent a communist revolution in 1919 as Bela Kun tried to repeat the Bolshevik achievement. Now this arrangement could not quite last here as uh, it did in USSR and it could last only for 133 days and eventually fell to the counter revolutionary forces. So, you have the traditional forces, the conservative elements who uh, gained ascendancy in Hungary immediately after Bela Kun uh, experiment. All other attempts in the 1920s and 1930s to establish leftist dictatorships did not quite meet with success. So, while we are saying that uh, dictatorial regimes is the order of the day in the interwar period, we have very limited success for leftist dictatorships barring a couple of countries that we just discussed. So, uh, what we have as the uh, other phase of dictatorial regimes in the interwar period is dictatorships from the right uh, of the political system, from the right wing of the political spectrum. And here uh, again we find it in uh, terms of revolutionary totalitarianism and uh, 1922 we get to see Mussolini in Italy setting the pattern for a number of other leaders by assuming control of Italy through fascism and in 1933 uh, similar kind of uh, 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 similar kind of uh, change is seen in uh, Germany uh, at the behest of Hitler who is appointed as chancellor in Germany inaugurating a ruthless regime of uh, of uh, nazism that is also known as the nazi uh, as the nazi third reich uh, despite being rivals for control over central europe Italy and Germany forged a working diplomatic partnership known as the Rome-Berlin Axis and this Rome-Berlin Axis undermined the remaining democracies on the one hand and checkmated Soviet Russia on the other. So, uh, as, uh, as uh, the right wing dictatorial regime gained ascendancy in Europe, we find uh, uh, threats uh, from uh, either of the ways uh, the democratic uh, regimes uh, wh whoever were left so far and the socialist Soviet Russia both were kept at bay by this alliance and uh, therefore this conservative authoritarian regime uh, uh, again we find in 1920 uh, Horthy establishing control over Hungary that we just spoke of. Uh, that after this leftist experiment uh, we have the right wing uh, totalitarian regime coming uh, in Hungary. Uh, similarly, in 1926 uh, Pilduski uh, uh, takes control of uh, Poland uh, in an uh, authoritarian way which again uh, can be understood as right wing uh, leadership, uh, right, -wing, uh, uh, right wing dictatorship. 1932 Austria moved to the right under uh, Dolphus. Uh, from 1934 till Austria's absorption into Germany in 1938. So, be it Austria, Poland, Hungary, they are all uh, getting uh, folded uh, under the right wing authoritarian regimes. In 1926, uh, Lithuania and in 1934, Latvia both uh, also fell to similar kind of political regimes. So, in this part, in this first part of the lecture on the interwar period in Europe, interworld war period in Europe, what we discussed is that democratic liberal regimes uh, are finding it difficult to, uh, to, to uh, accommodate the tumultuous circumstances that are developing in the interwar period and most of the uh, polities are succumbing to dictatorial regimes, be it the left-wing politics or the right-wing politics. Thank you.